A river is a complex web of life, constantly in motion and always prepared to surprise those curious enough to look under the surface. If you study a river in Virginia's mountains, you're almost sure to find one thing, trout. Trout are cold water fish that like water that is clean, clear, and free from pollution. Trout are predators in the river, eating many kinds of tiny aquatic insects that live in the water. They in turn become the quarry for trout fishermen. Trout fishing is such a popular sport that the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries raises a million trout a year in hatcheries to stock in our rivers. Virginia has over 2,800 miles of trout streams. Let's travel to Western Virginia and take a closer look at two of these streams, Spring Run in Bath County and Highland County's Bull Pasture River. We'll begin our trout adventure at the fish hatchery on Spring Run with the students from Valley Elementary School. I'm Nikki Fridley, sixth and seventh grade science teacher at Valley Elementary School. I'm Carla Fry, seventh grade Valley Elementary School. Hi, I'm Marisa Harrison from Valley Elementary School. Hi, I'm Dylan Purdue from Valley Elementary School. Hi, I'm Neil Chess of Valley Elementary School. I'm Tyler Bradley from Valley Elementary School. Well, y'all want to feed fish? Yeah. Come on, let's go. Here's Marty Durant. He's the hatchery manager, and he knows a lot about raising trout. With fish food and buckets on board, the first thing to do is feed the fish. They know an awful lot about, about trout nutrition. They've been growing trout for well over 100 years, and of all the fish, they probably know the most about what the nutritional requirements of, the, of trout are. Uh, trout, they, they do much better on a, a, a fish-based diet because that's kind of like what they, they normally will eat in nature, but they also, they're, they're somewhat omnivorous as well. They'll eat all kinds of bugs and crayfish and, that type of thing, but this is fairly simple. Who wants, to, who wants to go first? Do you need me to show you how to do it? It's real simple. You want to hang on tight to your, to your scoop, and then just watch so you don't spill it. The idea is to broadcast it, is to broadcast it and spread it out as much as you can. You can see there's an awful lot of fish in here. There's probably something like about 80,000 fish in here. These are year-old fish, they're Shastas. Um, that's just this particular strain of the rainbow trout. We have the Shastas and rainbow trout in these, in these two ponds, and the pond behind us is brown trout. So you, if you'd like, somebody grab a bucket and, and just kind of walk down the, the pond way, and just kind of sling it out as you go. Again, with the feeding, why do you walk down the pond? Some people will think, well, the fish will just come right over to you. Yeah, well, they will, but you want to spread it out because not all of them, the, you can see the fish are all spread out in the pond, and they all need to get equal access to the feed. Otherwise, we tend to see a lot of larger fish and some small fish. And the whole idea is to try to get them to grow as uniformly as possible. Feeding is probably the most important thing that's done, not only from the fish's point of view, but it lets you know from the, from the culture point of view that that everything's going well with your fish. When they do that for you, that's awesome. That means they're happy. After feeding the fish, the students have plenty of questions for Marty about trout and trout culture. How come the fish are swimming up the stream? Part of the reason why they're doing that is because of the way that they breathe. They take in water into their mouth and then they pump it across their gills. When the fish face the water like that, it actually costs them less energy just to allow the water to flow across their gills rather than to actively have to pump it across their gills. They call that feature positive reotaxis, and that just means that they face into moving water. And you would ask, you'd ask, you had a question? Well, in streams, fish are scared of people, but here they're not. Great. What they do here is, is they, will, they will imprint to what they see at the pond bank in terms of the light reflected off of our bodies, and it basically, it, it, it conditions them to a stimulus. When they see that, they know that feed is going to follow most of the time, so that they will come over to you in the ponds. 
Once they're stocked into the rivers, though, they'll revert back to their older, their, their native instincts, where they'll they'll try to avoid the things in the pond bank. Because imagine if it's if they if they're swimming over to something on the pond bank, and that and that something is a heron. Next thing you know, it's heron's dinner. If or if it's a bear, next thing you know, it's a bear's dinner, or any any other type of a predator. Now that they know a little about trout, the students are anxious to try and catch one. You're not allowed to fish in a hatchery, but fishing in Spring Run, just below the hatchery, is the next best thing. I see one, two, three. a lot of big ones. Look at them over there. These are nice. Wow. More than five. Spring Run, with its cold, clear water, is a great public fishing spot. There's easy access and parking for fishermen, and plenty of trout to catch. fish got away, and it's also time for us to go. But not everyone wants to, and we hear the words that every fisherman has said. Oh my gosh. Back on the bus, we head for the bull pasture, where we get right into the water for a closer look at life in the river. Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries biologist Paul Bugas introduces the study of aquatic life in the Limestone River. We've moved our location down here to the beautiful Bull Pasture River. You can see it's a lot bigger water down here, a little bit different colored. It's in a totally uh, different watershed than Spring Run. So what we want to do down here today is do a couple things. We want to look at some of the water chemistry in here, do some basic tests with water chemistry, and then we're going to get in and do a little bit of biomonitoring here to see what kind of bug life is in the bottom of the stream. And as we know that it determines uh, whatever bug life we find will determine whether or not the stream is healthy or, or not healthy. We're going to take pH, dissolved oxygen, and temperature today, and we'll just record the results. First thing I'd like, for, I'd like to do is when you go to the doctor's office, what's the first thing the doc usually does? Temperature. Take your temperature. Okay. Could you please take the temperature with this? Just hold it. Temperature is one of the big indicators of a trout stream's health. Scientists use degrees in Celsius instead of Fahrenheit to measure the temperature. I think 14, okay, you 15, got it. somewhere in there. Trout demand cold water. They got to have it. If the water temperature gets too high, but this water temperature in the summertime gets a whole lot over 21 degrees, which in Fahrenheit is about 70. If it gets up in the mid 70s, trout are going to move out of the area and try to find some place that's a little bit cooler so that they can survive over the summertime. So the second test is to identify the pH levels in the bull pasture. After chemically treating the water in the test tube, a color chart shows the pH. And is that good or bad, guys? Do you know? That's actually yeah. good. That's exactly right. Six to eight is a good range. So a sample of river water is also taken and treated to test for dissolved oxygen. Eight parts per million is an acceptable range. With everything looking good, it's time to stir up the substrate and see what lives on the bottom of the river. So why don't you guys work back? You ladies can work right around them too, okay? Kick and make it muddy as you can. Rub down into it with your toe as best you can and let the water drift down, the flow drift down the muddy water into your net. And this is one way we'll collect some, some invertebrates. Oh, we gotta get muddy. It's in the back. Oh, a little wet. <laughs> Let's find out what we captured in the nets. Oh, here's our fish. Can we just leave that dead one in there? Yeah. Take it out. Yeah, fish in there. Oh, no, it's dead. No, it's not. <laughs> An assortment of aquatic life is carefully removed from the nets and placed in a pan of water for closer inspection. Here's a sampling of what we found. Pilgrimite. Crayfish. Mayfly. That is a, a uh, predatory caddisfly. I like that caddisfly because it's the color of your shirt. The amazing world of underwater life comes alive 
as the students study everything from mayflies. Look at the gills work on this this mayfly. Isn't it cool? To crayfish. Okay, yeah. that's a male by the little thing. You see the little things right there? Well, the, that's the a female because it doesn't have right it. And that's, I'm this is the thing that it ain't got. Everything we caught and identified in the river is eaten by trout. There are three species of trout in Virginia. The colorful brook trout is our only native trout. The rainbow, with its brilliant red stripe, is a fish brought in from out west. And the big brown trout, a fish that was imported from Europe, now lives in many Virginia rivers. Just up the road where a tiny tributary enters the bull pasture, we can catch brook trout, browns, and rainbows. It's rare to find all three species in one little stream. Wearing backpack electrofishing gear, Paul enters the stream to do an electronic survey. The electricity stuns the fish momentarily, so we can study them. The first fish caught was a brown trout. Now I'm going to say that this brown is a stream-raised brown. Here's a rainbow that also hatched in the stream. Stream bred rainbow. And finally, Virginia's state fish. This is a classic jewel of Virginia, a native brook trout. This is a male fish. The orange on its belly will get even more brilliant if you can imagine in the fall when they go to spawn. Uh, it started to get a little bit of a kipe or a hook jaw on the bottom. Brookies live to be about four or five years old, usually just four in Virginia. Uh, this fish is old enough to spawn. It's a sexually mature fish, male, so it'll be spawning in the fall. With a new appreciation for the brook trout and its aquatic habitat, the students end the day sharing their newfound knowledge. Uh, my name is Teresa, and I learned a lot of things today. Um, about the water and everything that's in it, like the uh, bugs and the fish and all the different kinds of grasses and everything. Okay. I learned that trout eat the mayflies and uh, caddisflies and stoneflies and lots of bugs and stuff. My name's Carla and my favorite part of the day was looking up close at the bugs and learning what type of crayfish, male or female. My name is Tyler and I learned a lot today and I don't think you should pollute the water or nothing because it's nice to keep the rivers clean so we can all fish it. My name is Dylan and my favorite thing I learned today was uh, how to shock them fish and how the fish get raised in the hatcheries. I think water quality is important because it keeps the fish alive and the world alive.